Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, and today we're going to look at three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do, and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please remove all the raisins from the like button's raisin brand. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. From 2000 to 2013, Cornelius Mike Anderson miraculously turned his life around. Growing up in a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, Mike was a troubled young man that seemed destined for jail time. But something changed for him in the year 2000 when he was 23 years old. Suddenly, he wanted to make the most out of his life. So he distanced himself from his old friends and he moved to a different suburb outside of St. Louis called Webster Groves. There, he started a successful construction company. He got married, divorced, married again. He had three kids and became the father to a stepchild. He was very active in his community, volunteering countless hours at his church, as well as becoming a youth football coach. Anyone that met Mike after the year 2000 only had wonderful things to say about him. But Mike had a big secret about his past that he was just hoping never saw the light of day. Back in 1999, when Mike was 23 years old, he robbed a Burger King outside of St. Louis at gunpoint. He was arrested in the year 2000, convicted of armed robbery, and sentenced to 13 years in prison. Shortly after his conviction, he was out on bail pending the outcome of his appeal. But when his appeal was denied in May of 2002, Mike was expecting to go back to jail. And so he asked his lawyer, you know, what are the next steps? Because I'm out on bail. Do I go to the jail? Do, do they come to get me? And his lawyer said, oh no, they'll issue a warrant for your arrest. They will come to your house and they will take you to jail. So Mike got his affairs in order and he waited to go to jail. But no one ever showed up. And so days turned into weeks, turned into years, and no one ever took Mike to jail. Because it would turn out the state had made a clerical error, and they believed Mike was already behind bars when he was actually just at his home. And in July of 2013, at the end of his original 13-year sentence, they went to go release him from prison. That's when they realized he had never been incarcerated. So eight U.S. Marshals immediately went to his house and they arrested him and they brought him to jail. And there was this huge public outcry that it was totally unjust that you're arresting him now because it's the state's fault that they did not bring him to jail. It's not Mike's fault. And Mike used that opportunity to become a totally changed man. And so after a number of appeals and this very public petition of people trying to get Mike out of jail, a judge finally took a closer look at Mike's case. And it would take this judge only 10 minutes to come to the conclusion that Mike was in fact a changed man and should not have to serve the rest of his sentence. And so although Mike was held for nine months after being rearrested, he was released and today he is a free man. The Trump family were by all accounts a normal, hardworking household. 51-year-old Mark Tromp and his wife, 53-year-old Kobe Tromp, had established a successful red currant farm and earth-moving business at their property in Sylvan, which is just outside of Melbourne. Their three adult children, which were 29-year-old Rihanna, 25-year-old Mitchell, and 22-year-old Ella, all lived and worked with them at the farm. But their seemingly ordinary lives would change forever on Monday, August 29th, 2016. That day, without any warning, the family dumped their passports, credit cards, and cell phones on the kitchen table and ran out the front door, leaving it unlocked. They hopped into Ella's car and drove north. 30 kilometers into their journey, and it was discovered that the son, Mitchell, still had his phone. And so the others yelled at him to throw it out the window. And so he did. He chucked his phone out the window. The family drove all day and night until they reached a motel in the New South Wales town of Bathurst, 800 kilometers away to the west of Sydney. The following morning, Mitchell decided he did not want to be a part of whatever it was they were doing, and so he abandoned his family and began heading home. The remaining four family members did not go after Mitchell. Instead, they just piled back in the car and drove east to a popular tourist destination called the Genelin Caves. It was there that the two daughters, Rihanna and Ella, decided that they also did not want to be a part of whatever it was they were doing, and so they snuck away from their parents and stole a car and began heading home. The parents, after realizing their daughters had now left, did nothing. They did not go after them. The two sisters drove south to the town of Goulburn, where they called the police 
to report their parents missing. The story made its way into the media where the family was initially ridiculed for getting lost in the first place and getting completely separated in an area they should know well. This is their country. It's not a remote area. They were near big established towns the entire time. It just didn't make sense. But when police went to the Trump family farm back in Sylvan and they discovered the front door was unlocked, there were credit cards, passports, and phones on the table, suddenly it seemed like there was a lot more to this case than met the eye. And so as this strangeness came into focus in the media, people stopped ridiculing the family and began speculating what caused them to suddenly flee their house. Was it something in the water they were drinking? Was there chemicals on the farm that was screwing up their brain? Were they running from someone? Were they in debt? You know, what was it that caused this strange sudden departure? Back in Goldburn, after reporting their parents missing, Rihanna and Ella inexplicably separated at a gas station. Rihanna just climbed in the back of some utility truck and Ella hopped in the stolen vehicle and started driving home. Later that night, Ella would become the first Trump family member to be located by police when she arrived at the farm and police were waiting for her there. Mitchell would arrive back home the following morning after taking a series of trains to get there. Once Mitchell and Ella were reunited, they made a statement to the media outside of the family farm. And as you're looking at them, it's clear they're totally shell-shocked. They don't know what's happened. And they're trying to articulate why their family left in the first place and what they were doing and where they're going and the best they could do was to say well there was a lot of pressure on our family and it was it was building up and these things are just difficult to explain and and I don't really know what we were doing. Mitchell would say that there was a belief that people were after them there was some paranoia there but that paranoia was predominantly held by their parents. While Mitchell and Ella were certainly in a state of shock they did seem mentally stable. The same could not be said for their sister, Rihanna. She was discovered by the driver of the truck she had snuck into after he had driven over an hour away. He had pulled over to check on something. He had gone around the back and then had the life scared out of him when he saw Rihanna just sitting there in a, what he called, catatonic state. She didn't know her name. She didn't know where she was. She was just sitting there. Rihanna was taken to the Goldburn Hospital where she was put into their psychiatric unit. As media interest grew, the parents, Mark and Kobe, got back in their car up at the Genelin Caves and drove south towards Melbourne. A day later on Wednesday, the pair had driven 600 kilometers to the Victorian town of Wangaratta, where they too inexplicably separated. Kobe turned around and started heading north again by means which are still a mystery, and a day later was found 350 kilometers away in the town of Yas in a very agitated state. She was taken to a hospital there, but then transferred to the Goldburn Psychiatric Unit to be with her daughter, Rihanna. Mark stayed in Wangaratta, and he was there for several days, and during his time there, he he was spotted by a young couple really aggressively tailgating them and then he was spotted again on another day fleeing from the car he had been driving. Finally on Saturday evening all of the Trump family members were accounted for when Mark was finally discovered sitting next to the road near the Wangaratta airport. He was questioned by police and then assessed by a mental health officer and then was released into the custody of his brother who was a police officer. And as they drove away Mark turned around and flipped off the photographers that had converged on the spot. He later released released a more contrite statement apologizing for the hurt and concern that were caused by these events and he also paid respect to the police and the volunteers that went out looking for them. After the investigation, the police determined that nobody was chasing this family. They were not in any danger. The family had also not taken any drugs. They were not in debt. They were not involved in any sort of religious cult. And prior to this strange event, the family had no history of mental health issues. After the dust had settled and the Trump family was just back at their farm going about their normal life, every media outlet wanted an interview with them to try to learn more about why this strange thing happened. But the family said, we're not doing interviews, we're not putting out any more statements, we just wanna be left alone. And so as a result, all people could do was theorize. And the leading theory was that the Trump family was suffering from something called folly adieu, which is a French term that means madness for two. And what happens is one person who is delusional can pass that delusion on to other people. And this typically only happens in very close-knit families or in very tight romantic relationships. While it's unclear which of the Tromps became psychotic first, doctors say it is clear at some point they were in a cycle of reinforcing each other's delusions if this folly adieu theory is the right one. While the full reasons for why the Tromps went on this strange voyage will probably never be known, the police deemed it a family matter and did not press charges.
In 2007, 35 year old Eva Vizhnirska was a member of the German national paragliding team. Over the previous two years, Eva had competed in 10 of the world's biggest paragliding competitions, and she had won six of them, making her the top female paraglider in the world. So, coming into that year, Eva was very motivated to work extra hard to make sure she retained that title as world champion. On February 24th of that year, Ava was preparing her gear alongside 200 other paragliders on Mount Bora in New South Wales, Australia. This was Ava's last training opportunity before her first major competition of that year, which was scheduled for the next week. As they were getting ready to launch, one of the coaches walked in front of the group and made an announcement. He said storm clouds have been spotted to the north, but the forecast was a little bit ambiguous. It wasn't clear if the storm was gonna move over their training area or not. So it was up to each of the paragliders if they still wanted to launch that day and risk the bad weather. Ava, who was really eager to get this training flight in, looked at the sky and saw that it was pretty gray, but decided that she was gonna do it. Worst case scenario, she would have to cut it short. The rest of the German national team, they didn't want to take the risk, and so they stayed grounded that day. Ava took a little bit longer preparing her gear, so by the time she was lining up on the cliff, she was only one of a handful of people that remained. And so strapped into her glider, she took a good run forward and launched herself up into the air. On the ground, the rest of the German national team followed in a van to track her progress and checked in with her from time to time with their radio. The first part of Ava's journey was incredibly calm. She followed the ridge line from Mount Bora for 12 miles until it ended, at that point, she entered into the skies over the vast savanna. As her GPS and tracking log ticked, tracking her progress, two large thunderstorm clouds appeared in front of her, one larger than the other. The vast majority of the other paragliders that had launched that day had launched ahead of Ava, and so when these clouds appeared, they had already passed that section, and so they didn't need to contend with the storm. As for Ava and the other two people she was with, which was an Austrian team member and a Chinese team member, they had a decision to make. They could either immediately ground their flight to avoid the storm, or they could attempt to dodge it. They chose the latter. They knew it was too dangerous to try to fly underneath these clouds because of something called updraft. At the beginning of storms, warm air is sucked up from the ground up into these clouds, and a paraglider, if they get caught in that, can get sucked up with the air into the storm. And so Ava and the other two paragliders began aggressively flying around the outside of these clouds when all of a sudden the storm completely changed. The big cloud overtook the small cloud, creating this 12 mile wide cumulonimbus cloud that now all three paragliders were stuck inside of. Any updraft is dangerous to a paraglider, but the updraft of a cumulonimbus cloud is famously dangerous because it's extremely powerful and it lasts for over an hour. The Austrian man was able to pull down on one toggle, point his feet, and begin spiraling all the way out of the grasp of this updraft. And he said he turned to look at the other two and he didn't see the Chinese man, but he did see Ava, and she was desperately trying to do what he was doing and spiral down, but she was clearly caught in the updraft and he watched her get pulled up into the black cloud out of view. By the time the Austrian man hit the ground, he would say it had become the worst thunderstorm he had ever seen with huge hail balls hitting the ground all around him. He took one more look up and he didn't see the Chinese man. He didn't see Ava anywhere. And he took off running for a barn to seek shelter. And when he was there, he pulled out his radio and he alerted the other teams of this emergency. Inside the cloud, Ava was hurtling up like a rocket. The storm was lifting her at a rate of 60 feet per second. There was nothing she could do to get out of this wind tunnel. Ava knew she was getting pulled towards the storm's eye in its vicious center because of the immense claps of thunder that just kept getting louder and louder and it also kept getting darker and darker all around her. In fact, it was pitch black except for the occasional flash of lightning that came very close to electrocuting her. As she desperately tried to keep her glider stable, she was able to place a radio call down to her team on the ground, but all she could say was, I can't see anything before it cut out. And at some point, Ava reached the eye of the storm where it's pitch black and the temperatures are are freezing and hail balls the size of oranges are pelting her left and right and the updraft kept pulling her higher and higher and higher until she passed out from a lack of oxygen and at some point this updraft actually shot her up and out of the cloud and while this meant she was out of the storm she was now in air that was 50 degrees below zero which meant everything, her face, her gloves, her clothes, the wings of her glider, everything completely froze. And to make matters worse, at the altitude she was at, there was almost no oxygen and she did not have a breathing apparatus. So by all accounts, Ava should be dead. But somehow, she didn't die. She just kept floating around above the storm cloud for 45 minutes. And then something happened. 
the ice on one side of the glider broke off, causing it to collapse, throwing her into a deadly free fall. And she's not in control. She's still unconscious. And she starts barreling back towards the ground like gravity has been turned back on again, going straight through the storm all over again. And so through the storm going at 90 feet per second, she clears the storm. And then right after getting out from underneath it, her glider miraculously just opens back up again. And the jerking motion of her suddenly stopping her free fall jolted her awake. And so she's looking around totally confused as she's gradually regaining consciousness and she's taking stock of where she is and she's still in the storm cloud but right at the bottom of it but luckily the updraft had stopped and so she was steady and she was able to reach up and grab her toggles and she was able to fly herself down to the ground and crash land and then she curled into a ball grabbed her radio and she called her team. When they heard her voice, they could not believe she was alive because the other paraglider that got sucked up by the updraft, the guy from the Chinese national team, he unfortunately was struck by lightning and was killed. And so they were anticipating finding out that Ava had been struck by lightning as well. But Ava had not just survived. When they brought her to the hospital, they discovered that virtually nothing was wrong with her. She had some pretty bad bruises and cuts from the hail, and she had a little bit of frostbite on her face, but it was treatable. And so the same day she was brought in, they discharged her. After leaving the hospital, Hospital, she and her teammates went back to the launch site so she could collect her gear and when they got there she looked at her GPS and the GPS had been tracking her entire flight the entire time she was up in that cloud and she showed her teammates what it said and they literally couldn't believe it. The screen showed she had reached an altitude of 32,634 feet which to put this in perspective is the same altitude you fly at inside of a commercial jet. So imagine being outside of your plane in the middle of a flight and that's how high she was. Another reference point is she was approximately 4,000 feet higher than the summit of Mount Everest. No human being had ever been that high unprotected and lived to tell the tale until Ava. So that's going to do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know what it is in the comments and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please remove all of the raisins from the like buttons raisin brand. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post short videos. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.